Hey everyone, this is Josh, and in this video we're going to take a brief overview of the Solana smart contract. In the past video, we looked at ramping up on Rust. In this video, we're going to just look at the high level of what it takes to create a Solana smart contract. It'll mostly be pictures with some small code snippets. Now, before we get started, I'm going to give a disclaimer. This is not development advice. If you introduce a bug that ended up rug pulling hundreds of thousands of people, that is not my problem. Always make sure to RTFM. Now, to start off the high-level explanation, here's a picture of what I took from the Solana website um, explaining just all the pieces involved in creating a smart contract. So this is the on-chain and off-chain high-level. The first piece of this puzzle is the on-chain code. The on-chain code is essentially is a smart contract code that you write, and though in the case of Solana, it's written in Rust, C, and C++. Um, we'll mostly be diving in Rust because it's the most loved language running four years in a row, I believe, according to Stack Overflow. So we write our smart contract in Rust, and then once that's finished, we deploy it to the Solana network, which is a, another conversation all on its own. But essentially, it's just a set of validator nodes hosted by other individuals on platforms mostly like AWS or Azure or GCP to run and validate transactions that people like you and me send to the network. So the next part, once we have our program deployed on the Solana network, we need to actually execute it. And that's what the off-chain code is, or basically you can think of it as the client code or the website that the user is visiting. There's a lot of ways we can talk to the Solana network. You can do it through the command line. You can do it using the helper libraries that Solana provides, usually on JavaScript, other people's implementation of the SDKs. And essentially all a user does is it goes to the website, for example, they send a transaction to the network to, for example, maybe redeem some Solana or see what you have locked up on the Solana program and a little bit more on what I mean by locking up. So now that we have a high level understanding of what goes inside the Solana smart contract lifecycle, we're going to dive into the most important part of Solana, which is setting the transaction and how we interact with the transaction. So a transaction is created on the client side when we, for example, want to do something with the smart contract. A transaction contains two pieces. It contains the signature and the message. The signature is essentially just an array of private keys or the users that's made for the transaction. So for example, maybe I want to do some liquidity mining. I would send a transaction with my tokens and the signature to my private keys. Now this is just for high level understanding. We don't actually need to do anything in the code regarding the signatures. What's more interesting is the message, which is actually the payload of information that we send to our smart contract. So what is a message? Well, if we break into a message, we see four chunks. Going through all this example, a header is just the information. You think of metadata about the number of signature accounts and read-only accounts without signatures that is associated with this transaction. Once again, we don't really need to know what this is. It's just baked into the system and everything's taken care of for us. The next thing is the account addresses. And this is just an array of addresses of accounts that we are interacting with. So that can just be me or maybe if there's multiple people part of the transaction, they include all of their addresses. And of course, just like everything we've mentioned before, this isn't really relevant and we're not gonna handle it. The only actual thing we care about is the instructions, but we'll get there. Next up, we have the recent block hash. The recent block hash is just the hash of the latest blockchain node that made a transaction. It's mostly just used to see if a node is outdated or not. And just like everything else, the code handles it for you. You don't really need to do anything with this. Now comes the most important part, the instructions. The instruction is just an array of data used by the smart contract to complete the transaction. Essentially, um, we can break into this even further, but this is actually where you store your information. That's the Solana processes to do whatever logic you want to do. So if we break into instructions, we see that the instructions object has three pieces. It has a program ID, accounts, and data. The program ID is the ID of the smart contract that we saved on the Solana network. So this is actually important. This is something we'll have to include in the front end. And next up we have accounts. And accounts is essentially just a array of accounts, and we'll talk about that later, uh, which contains state information about the user. And then finally, we have data. And data is essentially represented by a byte array uh, used by the program to handle each transaction. 
what's interesting about how Solana handles this is that the data we receive literally is we have to serialize whatever data that we want to send, and this differs smart contract by smart contract. We have to serialize the data to be bytes, and then we have to deserialize it on the on-chain code or on the smart contract. And that, in my opinion, is pretty problematic. There's just so many rooms for error, but there are other solutions like Anchor that help solve this. But I digress. So before moving on, let's take a look at some of the client code and server code that we have to write to do something like this. Uh, so this is the client code in JavaScript. Um, I've taken it from the Hello World example from Solana. So from line 203 to 207, we create a transaction instruction or the instruction that we see defined. The first item we include on line 204 is the counts or the keys. We'll talk a bit more about that later. So this is how we add our accounts. And next up is program ID. And as you expect, that is the ID of the smart contract we want to execute this code. And then finally, we have data, which is the byte array that we're going to send across the network. But specifically in this example, our smart contract doesn't do anything with the data, so we just give it an empty data. And then of course, after that, on line 208 to 212, we just send the transaction. Now, if we take a quick look on the on-chain code, which is written in Rust, the most important part about the on-chain code on Rust that we see is the function process instruction. So process instruction takes in three data types. It has program ID, accounts, and the instruction data. Now, if we look at the client code, that's the exact same data that we sent to the smart contract. So you kind of see where this is matching up. We're not going to do into the details of how we would actually process the instruction. That's in a separate video. But I just want to share how the connections are being made. And so the final piece of the puzzle is accounts. We know what the data is. It's just serialized data that we send across the network. And we know what the program ID is. That's just the ID of the smart contract. So what are accounts? So an account keeps track of the state on a Solana program. So what do I mean by state? Well, state can be anything. Like it can be metadata. Like for example, maybe I have 10 Solana net locked up on the network in an account. So this data or the account specifically is stored on the blockchain. You kind of some think of it as similar to a file on a hard drive. We, we, we save the data on the nodes and it just stays there. So there are five properties. I'm sure there's actually quite more. So the signer and probably no surprise is the signature of the user that is sending the transaction to be executed. So it's the person executing something on the client. So maybe if, if I want to exchange my Solana for my Dogecoin or something, uh, the signer would be me. Now, the next step is read only, and this is kind of a property of an account. A read only just indicates whether or not the data can be modified or not. And of course, if it's true, that means that we can only read it and we can't modify the, any data on it. Executable is more interesting um, and probably complicated. Essentially, an account is created at the deployment of a smart contract. And what's important about this is that only executable accounts can process any instructions. So what that means is whenever any user or new accounts get created, it has to be owned by the executable, by the executable account. Otherwise, the account could be considered invalid and potentially it could be a hack or something dangerous and it's ignored. Next up, we have something called rent. Uh, rent is essentially lamp word or just like a very small amount of soul. It's like 0 0.00001 soul or something like that. Um, that user has to pay to keep their account on the smart contract. And then when it reaches zero, the smart contract, like a garbage collector, will just remove the account from existence. Luckily for us, we can also make the account a rent exempted, which basically just means that we're going to keep the account on the network forever. Just imagine how angry someone would be if we locked up something super important on the smart contract, and then we accidentally just removed it later in a couple of days. Now, anyways, moving on, we have data. Data uh, is very similar to the data that we actually pass in the instructions object, but it's a little bit different. Uh, data in this instance is tied to the account. So this is where we keep the state that we store inside the account. Just like the data in the instruction, uh, the data inside the accounts is also a serializable data. So we know now that accounts also store data. Let's take a quick peek at what it looks like. So on the on-chain code, um, we can define a greetings account. And inside this greetings account, it really it, we only keep track of one thing, and that's just a counter, which is a U32 integer. Ignore the attributes on top where we derive. This is just some helper functions to help us serialize and deserialize our data. 
as we send it across the network. So now to actually use the data, this is a code snippet from once we get an instruction. We get a count that data, and then we will try to parse it into a greeting account. In this code, we just assume that everything is serialized and parsed successfully. And so inside this greeting account object that we get now, we can directly refer to our counter, which you can see right here. I wish I kept the line numbers, but we just increment our counter by one. And then once we've done whatever operation we want with our account, we can just call the serialize function on it, which then will store the new state on the network. So that's the on-chain code. What's also interesting is to look at the off-chain code, or specifically our JavaScript web app. So similar to as before, um, what's, we also have to create a JavaScript equivalent of our greetings account. So how do we actually use our greetings account in JavaScript? Well, here you go. So let's assume we get the account info again. We use that Borscht library and we deserialize the data we get from the account info dot data on line 226. That which will give us a constant variable greeting. And greeting is the greeting account which, with the field. So as you see on line 231, we call greeting.counter to get the data that we stored on the network. And that's basically the high level of sending data across the network to our smart contract and then querying for it back on the client side code. That basically wraps up everything we need to know about the Solana smart contract on a high level. From the on-chain code where we write our Solana smart contract in Rust, and then we store it on the blockchain. And then from the off-chain code or the web client, where you send a transaction across the network to interact with your smart contract, whether that's maybe making a swap on a DEX or just querying information. But of course, there's way more topics and implementation details that we've obviously not addressed, but I hope that you got a rough idea of what it takes now to write a smart contract and kind of how the pieces are fitting together. And of course, we haven't even talked about how we would set up an environment to even write a smart contract. And so that'll be coming up next. And if you're interested in, in keeping up with more videos like this, please hit the like and subscribe button. Otherwise, I'll catch you on the next video. Bye.